How are you declared righteous? See, God imputes righteousness to us from moment one. So did you deserve to be declared righteous from the moment you receive sonship? No. Do you deserve to be declared righteous today? No, absolutely not. You don't deserve it. You won't deserve it tomorrow. You won't deserve it five weeks from now. You won't deserve it five years from now. I did not deserve that. You won't deserve it three minutes before you take your last breath. You do not deserve to have righteousness imputed to you. Righteousness is imputed to you not by your efforts, but because you have exercised the faith that God gave you. So I, I, I'm preaching a big God, a little you, very little you, a, a, a microscopic you compared to God. God does it. This is the big picture. You have very little opportunities to move yourself in the direction of God. You play a, a very small role in your development as a child of God. But you do play a role because you have to return the ball to him when he throws it to you. <laughs> Thus the law became our guardian and until Christ so that we could be declared righteous by faith but now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. You don't need the servant to take you to school. When you're 18 years old, you have your driver's license and you have the keys to dad's car. Why would you put the servant in the car with you? Why would you walk to school with a servant holding your hand, making sure you got where you needed to go when you have the keys to dad's car? When you have your driver's license, when you've been given your freedom, why would you go back? Ferris, so, what are you talking about? More beautiful. <laughs> Ferris, my father loves his car more than life itself. A man with priorities so far out of whack doesn't deserve such a fine automobile. Oh, yeah. No, no. No! Ferris, forget it. You're just gonna have to think of something else. I'm putting my foot down. Why would any teenager in their right mind want to go back to mom or dad taking them to school when they have a car, keys, and a driver's license? If you had access to a car like this, would you take it back right away? Neither would I. No teenager would do that. Oh, you know, I just don't feel capable of making it to school today, two miles down the road, in my own car, without mom and dad hovering over me. No teenager. So why would you do that as a Christian? Why would you take the, the wonderful inheritance you've received and sacrifice it on the altar of pleasing some person around you in church? Why would you do that? But but Paul Paul is saying the reason you do that is somebody cast a demonic spell on you. Somebody deceived you into this role of allowing the the curse of the law to come crushing down on your shoulders. So what we what we have here again, verse 26, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's. Now, what he does is he transitions from this into chapter 4. I'm not going to read chapter 4 at this point in time. And he talks about adoption. And this is crucial. Now, ladies, understand this. I am a part of the church, the people who belong to God. That's what church means, a people who belong to God. I'm a part of that church. I am submitted into a local church body. I have a pastor. Pastor John Lee at Generations Church is my pastor. I just want to encourage everybody to really 
finish strong this year with your commitment to the local church. It's very biblical to be connected and committed in a community uh, of believers. I fully embrace the difference of when I'm here at God Loves Kids and, and I'm the one in charge and I'm leading this ministry and the necessity to submit myself to my local pastor. I do that. Okay? And, and understanding that I am a part of that body of believers who are the church, the, not the four walls, not the building, not the time of the service, but we interact as a family, interacting together, not separated from each other. We are one and we are the church of God. He calls that church the bride of Christ. Now, I thank God I never had to put on a wedding dress. You know, all, all this cross-gender stuff, you, you don't have to worry about me. I know that I would be the ugliest woman on the face of the earth. Full 260. Uh, you know, I don't know how Bruce Jenner allowed himself to be so warped by the, all those females he lived around. Uh, again, let me warn you, if, a, if somebody with the last name Kardashian ever wants to enter into a romantic relationship with you, run! You know when I open up my mouth, you're going to have some words of wisdom. Amen, yeah. sister. Like, Amen. Like, like. Run. Run! Don't stop. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Those women have something about them that is just wrong. Okay? You say, well, you're being judgmental. Hey, I got a right to be judgmental. You know? Uh, I can wa You watch them on TV. Tell me that they're right in some way. I've never seen them be right about one issue in the, in the entire time of any time I've looked at it. They're always wrong. They're wrong about how to live life. They're wrong about materialism. They're wrong about relationships. They're wrong, 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 wrong. And poor Bruce Jenner, uh, you know, got emasculated. He, he was, he was, uh, he had gone through the surgery long before he went through the surgery. Okay, they they took away his manhood, and he just adopted fully into the role. But you don't have to worry about me putting on a wedding dress. You know, are, are, are trying to, to dress up like a woman. It's never going to happen because first of all and foremost, that's not me. And secondly, I know I'd make a really ugly woman. <laughs> hello, Mom. Oh, hello, Janet. How are you now? Fancy seeing you. How's little Ralph? Oh, don't ask me. It's been nothing but trouble all morning. <laughs> Stop it, Ralph. Stop it. There, there's nothing feminine about me, okay? And yet, God called me the bride of Christ. And I fully embrace the scenario or, or the, the scene of being the bride of Christ. And I want you as a woman to embrace being a son of God. I, want you to, I don't want you to, to say, well, I need to be called the daughter of God. I, I need to be called, you know, a child of God. Did you just when call me a woman? I'm legally a man. I want you to embrace being a son of God because you have to understand how radical that was and how radical it is. Here in a culture where the only reason a child was adopted, the only reason a child was adopted is because the father and mother could not have children. They had no one to leave their inheritance to. And so they took a servant that they had fallen in love with or a slave that they'd fallen in love with, that person had been in their house since childhood, and they adopted him as a son. They wouldn't adopt a girl because a girl couldn't do this. So adoption was never available to females in this time. Why? Because girls couldn't receive an inheritance. Girls couldn't have the legacy of the household passed to them. They couldn't bear the last name. They were ineligible for adoption. Girls could not be adopted. 
And in this culture, this, the, the slave or the servant was adopted, made a part of the family, and at that moment had full access to all the resources of the household he was adopted in. He went from a slave or servant to sonship. And I want to challenge you, stop flowing in the spirit of, 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 of being an orphan. Stop flowing in the spirit of being a slave or a servant. You have been elevated to sonship. And ladies, Paul talks about it right here. There's neither male nor female. There's neither slave nor free. In the body of Christ, we are all sons of the living God. And by becoming a son, by, by, by hearing the voice of the caller, by turning his direction, reaching your hand out and receiving his hand, and having imparted to you the dynamite of God, that life exploding force of God placed inside you, that seed of eternity, the same power that resurrected Christ Jesus from the dead, the same power that said, Lazarus, come forth, that radically altered dimensions, told the seas to, to calm down, brought forth a fish with a gold coin in its mouth, fed 5,000 with a few little loaves and fishes, that same power dwells in you and is, may I say, fully capable of changing you, fully capable when you're focused on him, when your eyes are on Jesus and not sin, when your eyes are on Jesus as your life-giving force, not the law, you will exceed the law. You won't obey the law, you'll exceed it. I mean, Jesus was really dangerous. A, a, a belief in Jesus takes the law and, and adds jet fuel to it. And how are you going to obey him without him? How are you going to walk this thing of faith without being empowered? How are you going to do it without being in a life flow? How are you going to, to bear fruit without abiding in the vine? I can yell at a tree all day long. It's not going to give me one extra apple. You don't get more food out of a plant by yelling at the plant by shaking the plant. You get more food out of the plant by making sure that there is life in the soil. And then that life in the soil is transmitted through the root system to the plant and the plant's life force brings forth fruit. You want to obey God, stop looking at the law and start looking at him. Take on his nature and image and you will be in obedience. You will be fulfilled in the things of God. You will fulfill, completely fulfill the law of God. You'll walk out all things that are God's nature in your life if you're anointed of him. And, it, and if you fall short in areas, it's because you have not fully received sonship in your life. You not fully accepted the blessing of God operational in your life. You are operating in the spirit of an orphan instead of the spirit of a son. And ladies, you are a son of the living God. You at this moment, at this apex of scripture, God takes the very apex of the gospel. As he's outlining, as he's defining it, as he revealed it to Paul, he takes that moment to say, you are co-equal laborers in the vineyard. I am raising you to a place of dignity that not, was not being given to you by culture. I am raising you a place to e of equality. I am raising you to a place of, of neutrality under me. God was the first one to pay women the exact same way as men. He was the first one to treat women equal to men. So here's the deal. I want you to understand that as we proceed, I'm going to come back to this issue of sonship. Uh, I'm going to come back to the fact that 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 God has adopted you as a son or daughter of the living God. And, and I'm going to dwell on this over and over again. And, and someday 
we'll be finished with the Father series, and I'm going to teach verse by verse through the book of Galatians. Uh, we're going to we're going to look at some truths from Mark, but again, I want to keep circling around this. This is life giving. This this will enable you to to maintain your sanity in church. Oh yeah, she's gone. This will enable you to to defy legalist when they come at you, and uh, and and anytime someone tries to correct you, you need to ask yourself: Does that person know me? Do they unconditionally accept me? Do they unconditionally love me? And have they met any of my needs? Because if they don't do that, they're not qualified to really speak into your life. They're just they're just blowing off hot air. You know, I had a situation recently where I was corrected by a couple of people. Uh, they had no clue what they were saying, you know? And uh, and certainly the one thing you don't want to do is correct me without all your facts in, in line uh, because if I want to, uh, I have the intellect and the ability to argue. Listen, I was paid to argue for years. I did 600 interviews in one year. I was on Phil Donahue, interrupted him at least nine times on national television. I know how to argue. I know how to make my point. I know how to, to set people straight. I walk in grace with people. I try to lovingly minister to them when they bring legalism my way. But if you want to exalt the law in any way, shape, or form, if you want to give credence to the law in any way, shape, or form, particularly law that is man-made, you know, you know you have to obey them all perfectly all your life without exception in order for the law to save you. Can't be done. From the moment of conception until you end your life, you have to obey every single law. You don't even know all the laws. Face it, believer out there, you, you, may, have been, you may have been believing for 20 years. I guarantee you, you cannot sit down and write out the 600 statutes in the Torah. I don't like where this is going. Stop! Stop! No, 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 Please, please. Very few people could do that. On the face of the earth, maybe some Jewish people who have the Torah memorized by heart could, at, with painstaking ability, figure out which one of those 600 need to go on the list. But are you really going to do that? In excess of 600 regulations. Did you perform those perfectly? And, and Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. And yeah, he fulfilled it. He made it tougher. He didn't say don't commit adultery. He said don't lust. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? He said, he didn't say don't murder. He said, don't have hatred in your heart towards your brother. And, and so he just made it so much more difficult. He didn't say, fulfill these 10 rules. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, love me with all your heart, soul, and strength. Are the discussions themselves gonna be on the test too? Uh, Gwyneth, my dear, everything will be on the test, and the test will be everything. But fear not, for in the end, every one of us will be tested. And every one of us will be found wanting. I can't do that without him. I, I can barely love the people I like. Mm -hmm. Truly, it, it's very difficult to really love people. Think about it. And, and then we get into the idea of we're supposed to change, change without God, change without power, we're supposed to, 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 look, I'm ADD, you know? And there was a point in my life, you could walk in my bedroom and my closet was absolutely, completely organized. My bathroom was completely organized. My room was always clean and my car was always clean. And you say, well, well, you know, you'd reach maturity. No, I, I, I felt like in order to be a mature human being, 
that all those things need to take place in my life. And then I woke up one day realizing that it took me 10 times the effort that it took a normal person to live like that. Because I was ADD. There was, there was always some place that was messy in my life. And so being ADD, I'm faced with, with my own inadequacies quite often. I'm dyslexic. All right, which means that if you follow me on Facebook, you know I misspell words. Now I'm a best-selling author, written 15 books, sold over 1.3 million copies, and yet you would never want to read a book that had not been fully edited, fully polished, fully gone over by multiple people that I wrote, because spell check doesn't even do me any good. Now you can't spell nutrition without nut, am I right? You know, it catches about half of my mistakes at best. And so I have these handicaps. I have these thorns in my flesh. And I know about them. I know where I'm inconsistent in my, in my behavior. I know where I'm inconsistent. So, so when it comes right down to it, the Bible describes that my goodness, my self-powered goodness has a value. You know what that value is? Soiled underwear. Mommy, wow. That underwear you pick up from your six-year-old boy that has a big brown streak in it, and it's not the first one he's left, and you can't get it out with bleach, and, and you're looking at, how much could you sell that pair of underwear on eBay before you washed it? One bid, just does, one cent. <laughs> you're making me rich! Look. <gasps> what, what, Shane? You're not getting anything for it, honey. You know that. It's worthless. My righteousness is as soiled underwear, filthy rags. And, uh, and in fact, the actual description of, of that is so vulgar that I'm not going to say it. I, I, I just can't bring myself to say it on video. And I'm pretty good at saying things that are shocking. So at best, the best Phil Phillips can be, the best version of Phil Phillips in my own efforts is worthless. Without God, I am nothing. With God, I'm a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm a son of the living God. I have full rights to everything that God has Everything that God wants me to be is fully accessible to me as a son of God. I have been adopted and my last name was changed. My nature was changed. He has empowered me to do that which is right. And he has provided his imputed righteousness. He has to see me through Jesus colored sunglasses. I am covered by the blood of Christ so that it was preveniently provided, all my sins were preveniently forgiven, are being forgiven, have been forgiven, no matter what. And you, and you say, well, I, I just don't believe that. I believe you gotta do this, 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 and this. Look, I received Jesus as my personal savior, but I also received God as my father. I am his son. And there is no word for unadoption. It can't happen. Uh, <laughs> go kill that thing. <laughs> it's somewhere. Uh, this is really funny.